how that we are free from sin in Him. And we also looked at how if we die with Christ, we should also live with Him because death doesn't have dominion over Him anymore. As He described in Revelation, He is He which was alive and was dead and is alive forevermore. Amen. In verse 11, we pick up Paul is really building on the same thought here. <clears throat> he says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead and eat unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Amen. So verse 11 begins with, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves, that is in the same manner that Christ died in the sin, and now lives unto God, we also should, should reckon or count ourselves as also dead in the sin and alive unto God. Mm -hmm. No, we say that we don't mean that we are free from sin in the same sense that Christ is, but in Christ we are free from sin. In Christ we are free from the dominion of sin, as we'll see here later on. But as in the new man in Christ, he is completely free from sin. Amen. But Paul will begin in the next verse to the, really start with that struggle that we see in our life of the child the flesh and the spirit, if you will. But he says, Likewise, reckon ye yourselves, or reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. That sin does not have a free reign over us anymore. If we're, if we died with Christ, if we've truly been born again. <clears throat> And sin doesn't have a free reign in, in and over us any longer. Amen. It does not have power over us anymore. We saw some of this previously earlier in the chapter. Verse 2 tells how shall we that are dead of sin live any longer therein. Verse 7 tells us for he that is dead is free from sin. Verse 6 tells us that the old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. And that's kind of the what well, most of the rest of the chapter speaks about is how that we should not serve sin. Mm -hmm. That sin should not rule and reign in our lives any longer. Amen. He says, says he says here we are dead indeed of the sin. The sin no longer has control over us if we're truly been born again. Well, it doesn't mean we won't struggle with sin at all. But <coughs> without getting ahead of ourselves, ourselves, we shouldn't let sin just do what it wants to in our lives. Amen. But he says, you're deep, or dead and deep unto sin, but alive unto God. And as we live that we might serve and glorify God. So this is kind of what will be addressed in our next verse here, but just as Christ was raised again, that it might be to the glory of God, we are raised again spiritually that we might live to the glory of God as well. Amen. With everything that, really everything that Christ did was for the glory of God. He specifically mentions how that in his death and resurrection he would glorify the Father. Mm -hmm. And we are to do the same in our being dead to sin and living unto God. We are to live for his glory and honor. I know that's contrary to the ways of the world. They say live for yourself and live for self-satisfaction and make sure you Make sure you're happy in life. That's the modern way of thinking. But, all right. For the child of God, we are to live unto God. We are to live first and foremost for his glory and his honor. Do all things for the glory of God, he says in another place. 
But if we truly do those things, if we're truly saved and serving Him rightly, then we we will be happy no matter what Amen. comes along. No. I don't want to get down a rabbit trail, but I will say this comment that the world's way of seeking happiness, it's always fleeting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, they get something that might bring a little bit of happiness, but then the happiness fades away and they got to seek something else. But the scriptures tell us the way to have real happiness, and that's only, that's really only found through God So. Mm -hmm. He says here, back in our text, it says, When we are alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's only through the person of Christ that we can live unto God. Amen. It's only through Him that life can be found spiritually. It's really only through Him that a, a purposeful life at all can be found. Many suppose themselves to be living for God, but yet. They trust in everything but Christ, don't they? Right. And in reality, they do not live at all. <laughs> but spiritually, they are still dead. Spiritually, they are still in their sins. And yet they think that they are somehow pleasing God because they are doing good works or because they are attending the church services or because they've been baptized or, and so on and so forth. Or because they're a good person. <coughs> Without the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot live unto God. Yeah. Separate and apart from Him, it doesn't matter really what you do. You cannot have spiritual life. Right. That's why Paul adds this here, that we are alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Just as He died and was buried and rose again, only through Him can we also die and be buried and rise again spiritually. One day Amen. physically we will as well. It goes on in verse 12 here. Because we are dead to sin and alive unto God, he says, let not therefore sin reign. Right. <laughs> sin should not reign over us. It should not have rule as a king. It should not exercise power over us. That's what this word reign means. Mm -hmm. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. This is where it hits home and a lot of people don't like this, do they? That we should not let sin just run free in our flesh. That's what the mortal body is here. It's, mm -hmm. it's his body of flesh. It's this, the, the fleshly nature, if you will, the carnal mind. We know that it has not been perfected yet, but yet the command here is not to let sin reign in our moral bodies. Amen. We are not to let sin have the rule over us. <laughs> just as a side note, just, he calls it here the mortal body. That means that it's subject to death. Mm -hmm. This body, whether we're, saved, whether we're saved or not saved, this body is going to die. You're right. You can be more sure of that than taxes. Mm -hmm. so it is plain that the man wants to die after this the judgment. Mm -hmm. This body is a mortal body until one day we put on mortality and incorruption. It will, till that day comes, this body is going to die. Mm -hmm. Just because of that doesn't mean we should just let sin and do what it wants in it. Mm -hmm. No, grace and sin cannot reign together in our lives. <laughs> Yet there's so many professing Christians today that try to do that, don't they? Right. They try to claim that they're under grace, and yet sin is really reigning in their life. <laughs> well, I thought of the example of David and Bathsheba. We're talking about sin having to rule over us. The Bathsheba wasn't doing anything wrong when she was bathing. Actually, I think she was probably following the commands of the law. Right. But 
David wasn't where he was supposed to be. But all that aside, I'm sure Bathsheba knew what she was doing was not right in the eyes of God. But mm -hmm. <laughs> yet when the king says to do something, you do it, don't you? You couldn't question the king and say, no, king, I can't do that. If you do, that's how you end up in the fiery furnace or the lion's den, like those in Daniel. Right. I know we don't under, quite understand how a king rules here in America because we have a democracy or really a democratic republic, to be an accurate term. We are ruled by the people, supposedly. We have the president, we have the Congress, we have the Supreme Court. In a monarchy, the king has all the power. Right. When the, what the king says goes, doesn't it? And that is the relationship Paul is describing here of sin, that it shouldn't have that kind of rule over us. It shouldn't just, it shouldn't obey sin as if it were the powerful being that is in charge of us. Right. Because in Christ we have died to sin. In Christ we, sin doesn't have the meaning over us anymore, as verse 14 tells us. Well, <laughs> he says, let not, therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. And when sin reigns, we will follow and obey the lust of the flesh. Amen. When we let sin do it, Whatever it wants to, will follow whatever lust that this flesh has. James 1.15 tells us that lust, when it has conceived, brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Amen. It starts out as lust, but it always grows into more and more and more. Before we know it, it's taking us way farther than we ever wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Galatians 5, 16 tells us how not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So it says to walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. That seems very simple, but it's a lot more difficult to put into practice. But I think sometimes we use that we are a sinful body as an excuse. Sometimes let sin do what it wants to. And as we'll see in chapter 7, I think we all are familiar with the context there that Paul describes how he would do good evil was present with him. And how he wouldn't do what he wanted to and would do things he didn't want to do. Yet he never said, well, that's just how it's going to be. <laughs> he, knew, he was never content with that struggle. Right. I want to turn to Galatians 5 real quick. <laughs> We'll go ahead and read verses 16 and 17. This I say then, Galatians 5, 16. Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. But notice verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these things are contrary to one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on, verses 19, to begin to list the works of the flesh. But we are going to have a struggle if we try to serve God. Mm -hmm. Yet, that is where the difference is between letting sin reign in our mortal body versus experiencing that struggle of the flesh versus the spirit. There are many professing Christians today who just let sin reign and say, well, that's the flesh. Nothing I can do about it. But we are to try to rule it or rein in that sin, if you will. We're trying, we're, our call to serve God with our bodies, as we see here in verse number 13. <coughs> he says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness of the sin. Well, neither, that is, after he tells us not to let sin reign in our moral body, he gives us even further commandment it says our members shouldn't even be used for sin. Mm -hmm. Neither yield you your members. 
that even any part of our body should not be let to be used for sin. <coughs> you you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. That we should not let any, even the smallest parts of our body, be used for that which is unrighteous, that which is sinful in the sight of God. Amen. That yield is to, to present or to give up to. That we're not to say, yeah, here you go. We're not supposed to, we're supposed to struggle and fight with those things. And I'd say as long as we try to serve God, we will struggle with sin. That's it. We don't need to be guilty of this giving up to sin. If we do that, then we've lost the battle. Mm -hmm. Either you'll need your members as instruments of unrighteousness and sin. That's tools or weapons, you could say, or instruments that we would use. They would be used to further sinful causes. If they were used for that which is morally wrong and unjust, we should not be yielding our members or any part of our bodies or such things. Amen. Whether it's our our hands that are doing something, whether it's our feet that are taking us somewhere, whether it's our eyes that are looking upon us. We can go on and on. Those type of examples. We should never just give ourselves up to sin. In fact, 1 Corinthians 9, 27 tells Paul there he says that he brings his body into subjection lest he should appear as a castaway. Mm -hmm. he, I believe what it means is here there is that he makes his flesh obey that it wouldn't he wouldn't be just as an unsaved person is. He wouldn't appear just as wicked of the world. And we are to do the same thing. We are to really if necessary, I don't mean literally beat this flesh into subjection, but beat it into subjection if we had to. Right. <laughs> so that we would not be living in sin. Mm -hmm. so that's perhaps a difficult thing to do, especially in our, our day and age, which tells you just to, to do what makes you happy and to, to do that which is pleasing to yourself, oh, that's not a big deal, that's what they'll tell you, or that's not a, no, that's old fashioned, or that doesn't matter anymore. No, we are, we probably will stick out like a sword on if we actually try to live Amen. as for God. Amen. We say, no, I won't have any part in that. <laughs> but all that is part of the struggle for the child of God, not yielding ourselves Un, as instruments of unrighteousness. He says next part of the verse, but that he gives us here what we are rather to do. He says, but yield yourselves unto God. We are to give ourselves completely unto God, aren't we? Amen. Well, that's also not not popular today. We, we give ourselves completely to God. They would say, well, this is my body, I'll do what I want to with it. <laughs> or if you're saved, that's not what the scripture commands us to do. 1 Corinthians 6 20 tells us that we are bought with a price, therefore glorify your God in your bodies. When God redeemed us, he purchased every part of our being. And we are to glorify him even in this flesh. And we are to glorify him with every part of our being. Amen. Really, every ounce of our being should be given to given to God to be used of him. What is the greatest commandment that Christ said was to love God with all your body and all your soul and all your mind? Amen. But that doesn't leave out the flesh, that doesn't leave out the mind, that doesn't leave out any part of us, does it? Mm -hmm. Let's go turn to Romans 12, 1 for just a minute. I'm sure we all know this verse, but it goes along with 
we're looking at here, verse 1 of chapter 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Amen. <coughs> and here he tells us we're to use our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. That's it. He tells us that's just our reasonable service. Giving ourselves unto God is really the minimum that we should do. To giving them even our body to be used in His service. That should be like a minimal requirement for a Christian. Mm -hmm. We act like we're really doing something if we give ourselves in the service of God. You know, whether it's I don't mean we should literally be sacrificed, as in, as some tribes still do in the world, right? But we are to give ourselves up to God and be used with Him however He wants. But that means that we are to forsake houses and lands and mm -hmm. careers and so on, and we are to, we should be willing to sacrifice those things for Him. Amen. Because we belong unto him. We've truly been born again. Yeah. That's right. why we are to yield ourselves unto God. <laughs> and I know Brother Larry has mentioned that how he always wanted to be a nurse at Vanderbilt. God had other plans for him. Right. I always wanted to go be an engineer at Ford or someplace like that. But God had other plans for me. And that. <laughs> That's still really very little actually giving ourselves up to God. Right. We already yield ourselves fully and completely to Him, no matter what that may cost us. As He goes on to say in the next part of verse 13, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Just as Christ is alive from the dead and glorifies God, we are to do the same. Mm -hmm. He is the one who rose us from the dead spiritually. We, Ephesians 2 1, and ye have to be quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Mm -hmm. and spiritually, we were as good as the dead in the graveyard out there. <laughs> that God gave us life, and we were to live as such. That, Amen. Heal yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members <coughs> as instruments of righteousness unto God. Instead of giving our bodies and our its members to be used for sin, we are to give it to the service of God, mm -hmm. to be used for that which is good. Well, that means we we are yielding our bodies and our members to God. That means we're not going to be self-seeking, are we? Right. We can't yield our members to God and say, well, I'm going to go do this thing that I want to do instead. <laughs> Or, God, you can have me for three hours out of the week. The rest of the time, I'm going to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. That's not yielding ourselves to God. That's not giving ourselves up to God. Amen. But we are supposed to completely give ourselves up to God in His service. And it's not a, just a Sunday and Wednesday thing, or not just a when we feel like a thing, but what did Christ say? Take up your cross daily and follow me. Amen. I'm going to turn over to 1 Peter and we'll close here. 1 Peter chapter 2. <coughs> well, a note, verse 24, but we'll go ahead and read verses 21. 24, get the whole context here. He says, For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. That was verse 24, who his own self bearing our sin in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, 
is that same thought again, that we are dead to sin, mm -hmm. should live unto righteousness by whose Christ we are healed. Amen. Here Peter tells us that Christ died and suffered that we should live unto righteousness. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems like many Christians today think that's a such a hard thing for us to do, or too much for God to ask of us, that mm -hmm. we would live under righteousness. You know, I, I don't mean the righteousness like Pharisees had, it was a, a self-righteousness. <laughs> no, we're trusting in our own righteousness, and we've got it all wrong to begin with. But we cannot look over the fact that God has called us to live righteously in this world. Amen. Or as Paul wrote to Titus, to live soberly, godly, <coughs> and righteously in this present world. Mm -hmm. well, we have been given life through Christ, and yet we are to use that life for the service of God, not for our own selves. He didn't give us life and say, well, I'll do whatever you want to. And say, I've given you life now. You go and do what makes you happy, or go what go do what you've always wanted to do. You know, by giving us life, he really we owe him our entire life. Amen. Not to mention the fact that he has purchased us with his own blood. We belong to him anyway. And we're really as a a slave to him. But we are his property. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's that's taboo language in our sensitive society today. But right, really when it comes to our relationship with God, in this aspect, we are slaves to Him. We are fully committed in serving Him. <coughs> Amen. As Paul says here, we are to yield ourselves to God and our members also. You know, that's not just, he doesn't say just yield yourselves to God or just yield your members to God. He says yield both of them to God. Mm -hmm. but yield yourselves unto God and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That every part of us is to be given to the service of God. Amen. I know that's a, a difficult task for us to do. We get. We are no longer under the dominion of sin anymore, so we should we should struggle with sin, yes, but we should not be ruled by it. Rather, we should be ruled by grace. Amen. We'll get into that a little bit more next week, but he also tells us in verse 14 that we're not under law, but under grace. Amen. So that's another thought for us to get into next time. We'll go ahead and close with that.